Hey, what's up, church family? Happy uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving. I hope you had an amazing Thanksgiving. I hope you found yourself uh, surrounded by some good food, surrounded by some amazing people, and just got to enjoy some time together, even at the bare minimum. I hope you got some time to just reflect on and be thankful for our salvation that we all have in Jesus. Um, we're doing church at home this week, if you remember, because we, our building is, is actually, it's just a complete mess right now. We've had so much construction happening last week, and we have so much more happening in this next week that I'm actually just going to ask that you all would pray um, that everything would go smoothly, that things would arrive as they're supposed to arrive, and that we would get as much done this week as we have planned out to do. Uh, almost every light fixture getting swapped in our main room, steel getting installed, projectors coming in and getting installed. There's just so many moving pieces. And so if you would just ask for favor, that all of that would go as smooth as it is scheduled to, that would be, that would be amazing. But today, we're not going to waste any time. We are going to continue in our Exodus series. And I know that you're uh, watching this at home, maybe sitting around some family. Maybe you could even uh, grab somebody to watch this with that doesn't normally come to church with you. Uh, but we're going to be continuing on in Exodus. If you remember at the very beginning of this series, week one, what we had said was really Exodus is, is our story. As much as it's it's an actual account of what happened to the nation of Israel in captivity in Egypt and God dramatically rescuing them. We talked about this last week where the Passover lamb becomes this kind of focal point, this, this climactic moment of the story for the Old Testament that parallels the climactic moment of the New Testament, Jesus being sacrificed on the cross on our behalf. And these two pictures, really as much as it is Israel, an account of literal Israel, it's also a, a beautiful story that we read in Exodus that mimics and mirrors our salvation that we have in Christ. And what we talked about was that that the story of Exodus, the book of Exodus, really is going to move through four main scenes, and that's going to be bondage or captivity, where Israel is enslaved to the Egyptians, just much like we are enslaved to sin, completely helpless to rescue ourselves without the dramatic power of God coming down and rescuing us out of our circumstance. The next thing that we see is freedom, where, where Israel is through the plagues, through the Passover lamb, is brought out through the parting of the Red Sea. They're brought out of Egypt in dramatic fashion and they are free. Just like as in Christ, you and I are free. We are no longer enslaved to sin. We are now more than conquerors, Romans 8, in Christ. And there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. These are great truths that we see playing out for the people of God in Exodus, but they're also true for our lives even still today. The third scene that we saw and that we talked about moving through Exodus is this idea of wilderness. That Israel, they're not just they're not just freed from Egypt and brought immediately into the promised land that God had promised to them. There's this huge space in between. It's longer than it should have been because of Israel's behavior, but but that sort of represents this already not yet tension that you and I live in today. That we have already found ourselves freed from the from the power of sin, but we still see ourselves like Israel kind of looking back at Egypt that even though we are at Egypt, there's still some Egypt in us and we're not yet to our final destination with the Lord, uh, but we are somewhere in the middle. We're in this wilderness. We're really the question that we're going to look at today. Today's message is all about the wilderness scene of Exodus. The last scene is going to be this story of covenant that God promises to one day renew his commitment, his covenant with his people and dwell with them again. And so today we're going to be on this idea of wilderness. And uh, the key question that I think we have to ask ourselves for this wilderness section that we're going to look at through Exodus 15 through 19 is, is this question of, can I trust God? Maybe even a better question is, will I trust God? Regardless of the circumstances that are playing out around me, regardless if my life as a Christian is unfolding the way that I thought it would, because uh, my life rarely pans out the way that I think it's going to pan out or the way that I want to drive it, but God is always going to be leading me and guiding me. And so the question is, is while he's taking me through these different turns, while I'm being led to a place that he will eventually show me, will I continue to trust him? Exodus 15 is where we're going to pick it up. And so if you have your Bible with you, um, maybe you could even just grab it, pause the video real quick and grab it. Um, look at this with us. In Exodus 15, what we see is, is Israel has, has just walked across the Red Sea. The Egyptians have been swallowed up behind them and they no longer have an enemy. Their enemy has been defeated. Now they just have this pillar of smoke and fire that's going to lead them. And their first response is a beautiful one. It's a response of worship. They go through this song of Moses and Miriam kind of closes out the song this way. I think it kind of uh, captures the heart of the whole song. She says, sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously in Exodus 20, 15 verse 21. Sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. 
the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. This song of worship, it, it magnifies and it kind of lifts our eyes up to the power of God, the power of God up pitted against the power of man and how that plays itself out, that God is always triumphant. He is a man of war. He is victorious. He is a conquering king. And Israel's response right as they are freed is just to get lost in this song of worship. And it doesn't last that long. And I just find this so kind of almost refreshing to my own soul that three verses later in Exodus 15, 24, it says, and the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And I, I just think this so p mirrors who we are as Christians that we can come into church on a Sunday and on a Sunday morning, we can be in the building and we can say, oh my gosh, God is so good. God, I love you so much. Yes, that's so good. Yes and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And we can be in this moment singing these worship songs. And, and then on Wednesday, we're whining about our boss or on Wednesday, we're complaining about our kids already. And there's just, there's this complaint and this whining that can creep into our heart. And those phrases, Israel grumbled or Israel complained, Israel whined, Israel uh, kind of draws their mind back to Egypt and even at some points is going to wish they were back in Egypt. That's kind of what's going to mark Exodus 15 through 19. That even though God is leading them, even though God has a plan for them and God has already shown up in dramatic power, Israel is wrestling through this question, are they going to continue to trust God or not? Uh, a verse that we can kind of hone in on is Exodus 15 verse 26 saying where it says, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians for I am the Lord your healer. And so this is going to really kind of mark out not just the rest of this message, but it's going to mark out the rest of the series that God, what he's doing in calling his people is he's giving them a, an established way to live. He's giving them commandments and rules. And sort of the lie that exists in culture right now is that if we, if we give ourselves over to God, if we surrender to God, then Christians, what we're known for in the world is being prude. Uh, maybe we're like known as being less fun. We, we avoid parties. We don't like to go out and have a good time. That, that really what the world sees through Christianity, and maybe this is through our own faults as the church, or maybe it's just through the world's lost paradigm of Christianity, is that we're seen as no fun, as our life being stifled and restricted so that we can fall after God. But what we'll see over the next few weeks is that actually Jesus' offer in John 10, 10 is so that we might have life and have it to the full. And so every commandment and every rule given by God is so that we would develop our trust in him there's a faith that's that's tested in his giving of the rule that are we going to follow him or are we going to follow ourselves? But every rule is given to ultimately glorify God and for our own good. So every rule has come to give us more life, not to stifle life. We'll explore that in the coming weeks. But again, this verse here in verse 26, if you will listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, give ear to his commandments and keep his statues. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians for I am the Lord, your healer. Jesus is asking them, God is asking them in this moment, are you going to trust me? I'm going to give you rules. I'm going to give you commandments. And he's kind of wetting their appetite for the coming of the law at Mount Sinai. And he's asking, are, are you going to actually follow and do the things that I ask you to do? Are you going to put your trust in me or in the life that you're now wandering about through the wilderness? And it's the same question before us today. The only difference really is that God gives them a very practical way to trust on him daily. And it's through this thing called manna. Um, so they are hungry. They are whining that they don't have as much good food or as much uh, stability in their diet as they did back in Egypt. And so God gives them this thing called manna. And we read about it in Exodus 16, verse 14. It says, And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. Um, so it's like this sweet, fine, flaky substance. In my mind, it's just always been Krispy Kreme donuts. Just like little, a little thin layer of Krispy Kreme donuts everywhere Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Uh, hopefully it's Sunday morning. Maybe you can find yourself still with some donuts. You went over to Donut House, you grabbed some donuts, and now you're watching this. But there's, these, there's this fine frost on the ground. Verse 15, when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is this? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. So God is giving them every day this frost on the ground. It's going to be called manna. We'll see that later. But it's Moses saying, God has given this to you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as you can eat. So do you hear the, this is not a stingy offer. God is saying, gather as much as you can eat. 
Take as much as you want. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it as much as you can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more and some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it until the morning. So manna is this just like fascinating thing. Uh, God had led them to this place where manna was going to be every day to provide for them. And as they ate and gathered it six days, on the sixth day, actually, this is where we get the first picture of the Sabbath. God says, take a double portion of whatever you need, and it's not going to spoil the next day. Instead, it's going to last you two days so that on the Sabbath, you don't work. There, there are There are several things that we can learn about manna. Here are four things that you can learn about manna. Manna teaches us that God alone is our provider. God alone is our provider. There was nothing that Israel was doing in this moment to, to cultivate or to sow and reap manna. God was just giving it to them. God was just uh, out of the overflow of his character providing for his children. Out of his love for his children that he'd called into the wilderness, he was saying, here you go. You will have food to eat. And this, for us today, what we can look back on manna and see is that we we should be giving God a daily relationship with him. It kind of fits that we're doing church at home on the week with this message because your relationship with God hopefully isn't just a Sunday to Sunday relationship with him. Otherwise, I think you're going to be prone to look more like Israel did when they were saved and set free and they go into worship one day, three days later, they start whining. That's not the relationship with God that, that he has in mind for you. He has a daily relationship with you. You should be praying daily, getting in scripture daily. Even if it's just a few verses at a time, we should be nourishing our relationship with God on our own daily. He, he wants to walk with us every single day. And so I hope that your, your pattern or your kind of rule of life is not just why well, I come to church every Sunday that it's convenient because then, you know, American standard would be more like one to two times per month that you're coming to church. And, and that's not, I love that God uses the picture of bread, of manna, because we can so relate to that with food. We don't eat once a week. We don't eat once or twice a month. We need to eat every day. We need to eat every day. And God's relationship that he has for us is something that he wants to provide nourishment for us in every day. The other thing that we can see is that you can rest in God's provisions. And so this is something that I just want to challenge. Maybe some of you, some of you real aggressive go-getters, you maybe tend towards workaholic. You can rise and grind. You just want to work, work, work. That we can actually, we can show and we can demonstrate that we trust God by Sabbathing, by taking a day and by not working, again, I don't think you have to be just doing nothing. I think sometimes the American version of a Sabbath is like, well, I'm going to go to church in the morning, then I'm going to turn on football in the afternoon. And I, I don't think that's necessarily the picture of Sabbath that God has for us. The, the Sabbath, we'll see this in the Ten Commandments, is a day set aside where we can worship and devote ourselves to the Lord. But that can be in, in cleaning things in your house, in doing routine things with your kids, doing things with your family, going for a walk, getting some exercise, doing something that restores my soul, not necessarily just that has me... Uh, just sitting doing nothing, but things that are actively kind of putting into me so that I can go out the rest of the week. The key with the Sabbath is understanding that Sabbathing isn't something that you have to do. It's something you get to do. A Sabbath is a day where you set it aside going, God, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you with one seventh of my days of productivity. And I'm going to give it to you knowing that you can do more in six days of mine than I can do at the full seven. That's the whole framework for a Sabbath. And manna is showing us that God is going to provide for us even on that Sabbath day if we don't gather anything. Gather everything you need through six days. On that sixth day, it will last through the seventh day, and that's what will nourish you on the seventh day. The fourth, the other, I'm sorry, the third thing that we see is that uh, our tendency with daily provisions from God is to take those things that he's given us and to see them as not enough and to kind of put our trust in ourselves to try and do more things with that. So you see it in verse 20. They've just been said, or they, Israel has just been warned rather to, to not take more than what they need for one day. But it says in verse 20, but they did not listen to Moses. I, I just am like, okay, here we go, Israel. Israel already is doubting God. They're not putting their trust in him. They're putting their trust in themselves. And reminder for all of us, Israel is us in the story. Don't think of yourself too highly when you read through this and don't look down on Israel. I think if we had a pillar of smoke and fire, we would still find ways to complain. If we were given daily bread from heaven, Krispy Kreme donuts on, your, on the ground, in your grass, every single morning when you woke up, we would still find things to grumble about. So we are Israel. But the tendency here is that they didn't trust, they didn't listen to Moses. Some left part of it until the morning and it bred worms and it stank. And Moses was angry with them. 
This, this is our tendency. With the things that God has provided for us daily, we tend to try and hoard or try and hold on to or try and store up more than what we actually need. And, and what God is trying to gently show us through manna is that he will consistently provide for us. And the more that we try and hold on tightly to our things, the more they're going to fail us. So Jesus actually, and here's where I kind of want to bring the message back just a little bit, is I want to show you that Jesus actually harkens back to this moment in Exodus 16 in John chapter 6. Um, John chapter 6, you probably are familiar with the story that it is the, it is the feeding of the 5,000 people is how it starts. So Jesus does this incredible miracle. He, he like takes this kid's Lunchable basically, he takes his Chick-fil-A uh, number one meal with like some sandwiches and some waffle fries and he feeds these thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And coming up, like really Jesus, what we're gonna see is Jesus does this miracle just to communicate a sermon. So there's a sign followed up by a sermon and that's how Jesus operates. He doesn't do the sign just to feed everyone, he feeds everyone to show something, so people a greater reality of who he is. So he feeds everyone, he does this great sign, um, he flees then, he goes to the other side of the sea uh, in the middle of the night, this is where he walks on water and it's this incredible story, but then everyone's looking for him, everyone's looking for him again, like where's this guy, they wanna make him king and, and that's why he had fled and so now that he's on the other side of the sea, they find him over there and this is where we kind of pick up the story, that people are saying, okay wait, you just did this amazing miracle, what does that mean? And so in John 6, starting in verse, starting in verse 30, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? They say, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. So they're going back to this moment in Exodus 15. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Two things that you have to understand. Jesus, in all the seven I am statements that he says throughout the book of John, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. All these different statements. That phrase, I am, he's tying the Jewish people's mind back to what happened in Exodus 4 when God spoke to Moses through the burning bush and said, I am who I am. Jesus, in this point of scripture, is unmistakably clear that he is calling himself God. He's calling himself God. And that's why you cannot be biblically honest and read this uh, Bible that you have in front of you and just act like Jesus was a, was a good teacher or he was just someone that we should kind of try and act like at times. Jesus is making claims that he is God. We're either going to follow him or we're not. It's not just we're going to follow his advice. Are we going to follow him, the person? The other thing that you got to see is what Jesus is actually saying here. He's not necessarily just talking about physical bread. Um, he's saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. It's not that you come to Jesus and you give your life to Jesus and you never get hungry again. That would be amazing. I feel like I'm hungry all the time. I feel like I think about food way more often than I should need to. And it just sometimes feels inefficient to always be thinking about food, always be thinking about my next meal. It would be great if Jesus' offer was, man, come to me and you're never actually gonna physically feel the pain of hunger again. What he's saying is, what he's saying is I'm the only thing that can satisfy your soul. So if you come to me, if you eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, this idea of communion that we talked about last week, if you actually come to him, you are gonna have that deep existential angst that is in you about what is life and how do I get life and how do I prolong life? That is gonna be answered only in Jesus. So here, here's how this kind of plays out. We all just had Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, I don't know how Thanksgiving looks at your house. For us, uh, it looks like a meal, probably around like one, two o'clock or so, where we just eat. And it's one of those days where uh, I can't really say that gluttony is permissible because that would be saying that sin is permissible. So that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that my plate is always bigger and more full than it ever needs to be. And I eat all kinds of stuff until I'm really like at that point where I'm uncomfortably full. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I sit down and I watch whatever football game is on the TV. Maybe, maybe I drift in and out of consciousness as I nap for a little bit. Maybe I'll nap with my kids. And then when I wake back up, I go, you know what I do? I'm back in the kitchen. Round two, getting some dessert again, getting some leftovers already. Like it's not even, the, the meal hadn't even gotten cold yet. And I'm already back there for leftovers. And so I'm just going to eat. And even after eating as much as I can physically possibly, like possibly eat in one day, I get hungry again. 
I get hungry again. Um, just in the same way that no matter how much food you have, you are eventually going to get hungry again. What Jesus is doing is he's, he's using, using this imagery of food to communicate to us. Like you and I all have this thing in us and every person that you know, and you've watched maybe people like this, where there's just this, this, this like inability to live in contentment, to live in a place where they're actually satisfied. And we're always going to be turning to money to try and kind of fill this satisfaction of our soul that, man, if I can just get more money, then I'll really be happy. If I can just get more money, if I can have that job, I'll really have the prestige or the value or the power that I've always wanted. If I can just have these relationships, I will know how valuable I am. And all those things, we're trying to answer this question of like, how do I get more life? How do I get more out of this life? And we're turning to these things to try and fill us. And Jesus said, Saying, I am the bread alone that satisfies. John Piper says it this way, that, he, that Jesus didn't just come to give bread, but to be bread. He alone is the one that can satisfy our soul. Uh, I think about what, what Jim Carrey says, and of course, he's a rich, famous person, so he gets the credit to say something like this, but I think we should all take note of what he says, that uh, I wish everyone could get rich and famous so they'd see it isn't the answer to anything. Jim Carrey's alluding at this picture that like, I just, I wish that you could get everything you ever wanted. This is what the writer of Ecclesiastes is after. I wish you could just see and you could have everything that you ever wanted on this earth to see that it is vain, that it's meaningless, that it's not actually going to solve that puzzle that's in you, that it's just like this missing void. Only Jesus is going to do that. John 6, 27. Jesus gives us a little bit of help here. He says, um, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. He says in 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. Here's an encouragement I have for you this morning, is that we wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily spend all of our tr time trying to nourish the things of this world, but we would spend more of our effort and put more of our heart towards trying to nourish our relationship with Jesus that's gonna endure forever. A few just practical ways I think you can do this. I think financially that we can make sure that we are, we are having stuff, but our stuff doesn't have us by doing a few things really simply. We can tithe. We can make sure that whatever income we're getting, uh, this is something Katie and I have always practiced, always done in our married life. We said, nope, we're going to surrender and we're going to give back over in worship 10% of our income, no matter what, whether we have lots or whether we have little. And the result of that over the years is, is much less about what our bank account looks like. It's much more about what our heart looks like, that our heart is not gripped by money. We, we have money, but money doesn't have us. And so we are continually giving away money, being generous. It's not just tithing, but it's also just practicing generosity. I think of all of you that contributed to the Here to Stay uh, offering. And it's just that we have these moments where we either adopt a compassion child, or we just give money to somebody that's in need, or we open up our home and we be hospitable to people. And we just always want to make sure we're living this life of generosity to make sure that we are not working for the things that are just temporary here on earth, but we're actually working and cultivating hearts that are in love with Jesus. So that's financial. I think the other one that we have to talk about is time because money and time are probably two of the biggest things that are maybe the biggest argument in your marriage, the biggest thing that occupy the most space in your brain. And so when I think about time, I think about how important it is that you commit the first day of your week, Sunday, to worship that you get into church. Don't be the American statistic that makes it to church once, maybe twice a month, Christmas and Easter Christians. Like be someone who has your time cultivated in a way so that you're not, you're not spending all of your time endeavoring after all the sports that are offered on Sunday morning, or, or that's my only time that me and my wife can go get brunch or all these other little things, these errands that we like to do. Man, make sure you're cultivating a life of worship because that's what lasts for forever. So cultivate a life of worship by making sure you're committing yourself to the gathering body of saints on Sunday morning. Come on Sunday morning, get yourself in some community then too. I don't think it's just about having a place where you go on Sunday morning. I think it's about having a community that you belong to. So get in a group, make time for a group. Maybe you can't meet every single week, but make sure you're staying in touch, that you're diving deep with a few, um, at least uh, outside of just the Sunday morning gathering, that you are saying, no, hey, listen, I'm going to prioritize my time with you because you help me look more like Jesus. This is, you are iron sharpening iron. You are a brother, a sister that I get to co-labor for the kingdom with. And that again is going to cultivate our souls to focus more on Jesus. The last one I think is just by serving. 
And what we're going to see here and how we're going to kind of land this is that God gives a lot of good gifts and our tendency is to fall in love with the gifts that he's given us rather than on the gift giver. And so I think the third practical way that you can work for the things of heaven, not for the things of earth, is by taking the gifts God's given you, whether it's money, whether it's the gift of leadership and you own a business, or whether it's the gift of administration and you and you help organize different things for people, uh, the gift of hospitality, you're good at bringing people in your home. Take those gifts and don't fall in love with the fact that you're so good at decorating your house and welcoming people in your home, but take that gift that he's given you and use it, give it away, serve other people so that other people can hear about the good news of Jesus. Whether that's in your business, whether that's in your home, whether that's with your kids, whether that's where you play, all those different spaces are gifts from the Lord that you can take and you can turn them into worship rather than making them terminate on yourself, on your own heart. And so here's the last bit of practical advice, I think, out of John 6, out of the Exodus 15, this idea of manna is that God gives great things. God gives good miracles, but don't seek him for miracles. Seek him for him. So when Jesus, uh, when Jesus says this in John 26, I just read it a second ago. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. There are so many people in, in modern day American Christianity who have a relationship with Jesus that just reaches out whenever they need a sign or a miracle and life gets catastrophic for a moment or something terrible happens, you get a diagnosis, the job doesn't go the way you want it to, marriage isn't panning out, these things start to go wrong, the circumstances around you in your life start to crumble, and that's when you cry out to God. That's not the relationship that he has for you. That's not the relationship that he's trying to establish and build with you. God, again, he wants a daily relationship with you. And so what, like, what does it look like if I have a marriage with my wife, Katie, and I only come to her when I'm in crisis or when I need something? That, that is no marriage at all. And yet, like human marriage really is a gift given to mankind so that we can understand what marriage and union with Christ is supposed to look like. And so again, I, hopefully, I'm not coming to Katie every time I just have a request or I have a need that needs to be filled. I think what this needs to look like is rather than us just continually coming to God when we have a need, I think you should have a prayer life where you wake up every single day and you pray for maybe 15 minutes to start your day. Um, I think that kind of prayer life opens the doorway for communication for all sorts of other things. But if you don't have that just boring routine practice where you just, I just, you know what, I just wake up in the morning and I just spend the first half hour praying and reading scripture. Well, then the tendency that we can fall into, if we don't have that to fall back on as a routine part of our relationship, then what we end up doing is we only cry out to him when we need him. And again, God, yes, he is going to provide miracles. He's going to show up in profound ways. He, he makes water flow from a rock. He takes bitter water, makes it sweet by throwing a log in it. He brings down Krispy Kreme donuts from heaven for Israel in Exodus 15 through 19. He does some amazing provisions. He's provided for an amazing way in your life. You just sat around a table and gave thanks to all these different circumstances that are going on because God has been good and he's been generous to you. But don't fall in love with his generosity more than you fall in love with him. All of those things are meant to be a sign that points you back to Jesus. I'll maybe land the sermon this way. My family, we like to go up to Estes Park at least once or twice a year, and we like to get up into Rocky Mountain National Park. And we go to this park called Upper Beaver Meadows. And there's just this, there's this little sign off the main turnoff uh, that says Upper Beaver, Beaver Meadows. And then you go back on this like kind of long winding road up this meadow. And every year that we've gone, we've probably gone like eight or nine years in a row, we've seen elk like right there, right in front of us in that area. But the thing is like Upper Beaver Meadows, it's like this trail that's off the beaten path. So none of the tourists know that it's there. They've all passed the sign but they haven't let the sign take them to an actual meadow where they're supposed to go. Do you see how this applies with our faith? If you are just taking the miracles that God has provided for you in your life, but you aren't letting those things cultivate a heart that actually loves Jesus, you've fallen in love with the sign. You're not falling in love with the person that the sign's pointing to. I'm just inviting you today. The wilderness season is a chance for you to trust God in the middle of some circumstances that maybe aren't going the way that you thought they were going. And you can say, God, I'm gonna give thanks for you in this daily provision. I'm gonna turn and I'm gonna remember the things that you have done. I'm gonna actually reflect on, I'm gonna dwell on, I'm gonna spend time thinking about how you've saved me, how you've been good, how you've been generous. And God, I'm gonna make sure I'm continually looking, not just for the good gifts that you're giving, but I wanna live a life that is marked by a radical devotion to the giver of the good gifts, not just the gifts themselves. Church, this is what we're after in the wilderness. And Jesus says it this way. 
because they, as soon as they hear this, and I think it's kind of our response too, they go, how do we, how do we work for that? How do we get that? And Jesus says, you are going to just believe in him. You're going to believe in him. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So all of these things, all the things that we're trying to work on are just really meant in a way to just help cultivate belief in us. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Um, I hope to see you back in the building next week. Lord willing, all this stuff's gonna be done. Our building's gonna be cleaned up, beautiful, ready to go. And church, I can't wait to see you again. Let's pray and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Jesus, thank you so much for our time to gather, uh, even as we are scattered and separate all throughout this city, God. Um, I pray that we would not just have full stomachs left over from Thanksgiving, but I pray, God, that we would have full hearts knowing that you have provided generously in so many different ways. Um, and I pray that as a church, we, we would not let our affection and our devotion just kind of terminate or end on the things that you've provided, God. But would we let all that attention and all that excitement, would we let it just roll up onto you? And would we see you as our daily bread? Would we see you as the bread of life? Would we turn to you um, rather than the things that we're immersed in? Would we turn to you and see you as you really are, the giver of life itself, the giver of abundant life? Jesus, we love you. I pray that you'd be with our church this week. And uh, God, we, we are excited to get back in our building next week. And um, yes, thank you for all the good things that you've provided for us, Lord. It's in your name we pray. 